Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a one-on-one -on -one course in bubble studies. That would be the crash quarter bubble studies. You might ask, what on earth are you talking about bubble studies? Uh, why do you have a center for it and for information too? I'll get to that in about 16 minutes. You know exactly why. Now, um, if you look at the background of this, of course, bubbles you will find in beer and you will find them in bathtubs. But uh, in the background here, you have the depiction of a great white. And there's a reason for that. The reason is basically this, that I submit to you that this is probably one of the most fierce animal predators of the sea. And I submit to you that bubbles are, to the information age, what these are to the sea. They're sneaky, they're deadly, they're dangerous, and they sneak up on you whenever you don't think of it. So from that perspective, bubbles are pretty much like jaws. Now, what are these things exactly? Well, if you look to finance to get the inspiration, we take bubbles to be situations in which asset trades at prices far exceeding their fundamental value. Now, I have depicted the tulip there, a tulip bulb, actually. And in March 1637, this tulip bulb was worth 10 times the annual income of a skilled laborer during the Dutch tulip frenzy. That's about a million, dollars, a million bucks in adjusted dollars for a thing that today would run you a couple of cents. So we have heard of bubbles before. And we have had dot-com bubbles. We have had bubbles pertaining to real estate in Japan in the 80s. We have had, uh, recently we have been the victims of bubbles too. And we are still in the aftermath of the crisis that we had in 07, 08. So we are well versed about these certain things having existing in finance. But do they exist elsewhere? Well, look, you know, whenever you trade, whenever you, need, whenever you have bubbles, you're going to need liquidity. Usually in finance, we talk of it as cash money. That's easily accessible, easily transferable. And from that perspective, you can build bubbles with that sort of liquidity. So you invest. But on a daily basis, we invest. We just don't think about it as investments. On a daily basis, we go on the web and we invest our likes, our retweets, our upvotes, our selfies, our emoticons in various points of view, religious stances, fashion items, status, you name it. And that's easy liquid, easy liquidable means. And so you can invest in a political stance with an upvote or a like. You could do the same in a religious. You could do the same for fame, status, recognition. So you could talk about there being opinion bubbles, bullying bubbles, status bubbles, fashion bubbles, political bubbles, a lot of bubbles. Be careful that you don't see bubbles everywhere, because you might end up in confirmation bias. So there's a little more to it than just that. You have to worry about a bubble hospitable environment. But before I get to that, let me give you a few examples on what we consider bubbles to be at the center of information and bubble studies on different platforms or in different domains or in different ontologies and what we usually consider bubbles to be present. So have a bubble. Now, who, who, who's this guy? I'll tell you who he is. His, uh, he is the gentleman with the most followers of Instagram in Denmark, by far. More than a million followers on Instagram. And what is his apparent qualification? His apparent qualification is that somebody thinks he looks like Justin Bieber. <laughs> the story started in 2013 when he posted three pictures on, on Instagram. And before long, the Americans started shouting, oh my god, he looks like Justin Bieber. And from that point onwards, from that point onwards, it was a carefully planned marketing campaign for him. He posted 12 pictures in 24 hours on a daily routine, factoring in different time zones, such that when he got to bed at night, he would have a picture taken, throw it on Instagram. Then the Americans would have something for the afternoon. When he got up in the morning, he threw another one, because then they would have something to go to bed with. And so it went, until he got 60,000 views a picture. Then clothing companies came and said, we want to do product placement with you. Oh, and by the way, add a contract to do records, even though this gentleman has definitely shown on YouTube that he does not sing too well. <laughs> on top of that, he makes his bar pretty high, so he doesn't follow too many. And he, it's pretty hard to get a hold of, actually, 
to be allowed to follow the gentleman. So if you can't make the bar following him, you can follow his dog that has about 40,000 followers on Instagram. <laughs> and what's the apparent qualification? You look like Justin Bieber. Now, are we talking about overheating status or recognition maybe just a bit here? We are talking about a lookalike feature that will get you there. And you might say, OK, so is this important? Well, is there a fundamental value to the asset? That doesn't necessarily matter. As long as you get everybody to believe that everybody else believes that there is something to it, that's good enough for trade. That's what day traders do in stock. OK? So that's good enough for you earning a buck on sympathy or respect or status or what have you. You might say, who cares about a 15-year-old gentleman and Justin Bieber? So by the way, it gets worse than that. <laughs> the second one is a tweet from April, 20th, April 23rd, 2013, to the effect that Barack Obama had been hit in an attack on the White House. It turned out to be a hoax, but it crashed the US stock market in minutes. According to USA Today, the American stock market lost $200 billion in five minutes, and it was a hoax. So this is how you create ma market panic with retweets, both for computers and for humans. So if you think that we can become irrational, then take it to computers, then you really got yourself a ball game, sometimes. So that's a little bad. That's, that's worse than the other example. This la the last example is basically from politics. This is from the 2012 election where the Obama campaign jumped the bandwagon that Vanity Fair and Associated Press had started out about Mitt Romney's blind trust offshore accounts tax havens. There was nothing to that story. It, it was, wasn't true. However, that didn't necessarily matter. It got a lot of traction. And if you can play on indignation, anger, fear, those sort of emotions, those have a lot of social traction. Jonah Berger has showed that in Contagious. So political stakeholders and politicians might actually speculate in what sort of his of stories can actually enjoy a lot of traction and then play along with them to the point where political capital and truth, they part company. Now, that's the way to post-factual democracy. So what we are talking about here is that cyberbullying can crush human beings. We can crash markets with bubbles. Oh, and with oh, and let's threaten democracy while we're at it. Be a little careful. So there are some very nasty examples of these bubble phenomena out there. Now, clearly, bubbles don't happen just out of the blue. They are cultivated in environments. The same goes for stock bubbles, real estate bubbles, and so forth. They are also cultivated. So one of the things that we do at the Center for Information and Bubble Studies is to look at what sort of assets are we talking about, say, on social media. We're not talking about money. We're talking social assets, sympathy, respect, influence, power, those sorts of things that goes between human beings. So we have assets. We also have investors, namely every one of us who's actually investing our opinion. We have noise traders called trolls. You know? um, we might also have traders who don't really know but think that everybody else thinks. So those are the sort of traders that uh, will follow the lemming effect of others. Um, we've got plenty of liquid means we were talking about selfies, emoticons, we were talking about clicks, we were talking about upvotes, likes, a lot. There's plenty of liquidity out there. We've got all our information vendors, and there are architectures in which they can actually aggregate and accumulate likes, so we can easily see what, what point of view apparently seems popular to a lot of others, just because that the cardinality of clicks is very high. We've got exuberance boosters. So if you can't get your point of view to get a lot of traction, buy it. Go to a like farm, start buying like. Go to a click farm, do the same. Oh, go to a very, very, very happy mortgage broker or a lenient credit union and get some money. You can do the same sort of here. Then we can have exuberance boosters. So those were the things I was talking about just then. And then, one of the things that we get from social psychology is this. We can be individually as rational as we want to be, but collectively extremely stupid. It's not because we are such, but sometimes we interpret the signals of others in a, in a very unfortunate way. Now, at the speed of light and globally. So basically, you've got social psychology on speed. Okay. Now, what sort of things? Well, Joey Novick, who is an American comedian, once said, ah, the information in the world doubles every day. 
But what they don't tell us is, is our wisdom is cut in half at the same time. <laughs> there might be some truth to this, in the sense of saying more information doesn't necessarily make us smarter. Sometimes we polarize much easier, and we collect information that we like, and then we disregard what we don't like. That's called echo chambering effects and polarization effects. And one of the things that we do as humans is that if we don't have enough information, we can't critically think about the case anymore. We can't gather more information. What do we do? We tend to, I know none of you would do this, but a lot of other people would. They would look to see what other people are doing and then copy that. You know, you're rational, you wouldn't do it, but people outside this room just might, because that seems to be whatever is successful. You'll copy that. There might be a lot of reason to that, right? Because then you actually buy into the experience that others have had, sometimes bought extremely expensively, but sometimes it's difficult and it's very dangerous. Let me give you an example of that. I start 60 students a year in logic, okay? I tend to give them a homework assignment, and the next day there are sort of two possibilities. Either I want the answer from my students or I just want to get on with the curriculum, but I don't want to tell them because then they get angry. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pop the following question to my students. What do you think was difficult with yesterday's exercise? And you know how they react? Exactly as you do now. Nobody says anything because nobody says anything. Because the way I frame the question, I'm indicating that it's hard. So if you're in doubt, you're going to say, huh, did I get it right? So I'm going to look to my neighbor. My neighbor says nothing because I'm not going to flag my ignorance. <laughs> so uh, apparently my neighbor doesn't have a problem. Then I'm not going to flag it. And this gentleman over here is going to look to this person. All of a sudden you go, Poof. You've got ignorance all over the place. Pluralistic ignorance. That means conditions under which it's legitimate for everybody to remain stupid. Terrible phenomena <laughs> in all generality. Now, what is the problem here? The problem is that I'm asking my students to orientate themselves towards each other before answering. So if I want to get rid of this, because apparently what I, my conclusion is, well, nobody's saying anything, so I'm just more going to move on. Ta-da, magic in broad daylight, yeah? <laughs> but if I do want my, answer, my students to answer, I have to remove the orientation act. And the way I will do that is basically ask them not to orientate themselves towards each other, but just simply forget about each other. The way I will do that, I will just reframe the question. I'll ask my students, what do you think, early, what do you think other earlier students had for problems with yesterday's exercise? Because this it doesn't have to refer to them. They can go, hoof, hoof, hoof. <laughs> ta-da. Now, take that to light speed and globally. All right, just a thought. The same goes for bystander effects, bandwagons, lemmings, and polarization effects. Now, polarization effects are dangerous. Uh, once you think that the more we deliberate together, the smarter we become collectively, wrong. If you put a group of people together who already agree, chances are they're going to agree even more. That's called polarization. And if you cut away all the information that you don't like, you get, it, you get yourself in an echo chamber with all your friends. That's what the blogosphere is all about. Because the ones who shout against you are just going to get out, start another one, etc. So political polarization is, uh, well, polarization is a little bit tricky and dangerous. Uh, now we have had, hopefully, a little bit of fun examples here, but there is a there's a moral lesson to be learned here, which is not so much fun. Uh, look, you can do this in politics too. What we don't want to end up is, is what we end up in is what we could call a bubblerocracy. So let's go back to the 2012 campaign of uh, the U.S. election. Paul Ryan was the vice president candidate for the Republican Party with Mitt Romney, and he gave a speech that even Fox News, even Fox News, had to label this particular speech. Dazzling, deceptive, and distracting. And Ryan's speech was an apparent attempt to set the world record for the greatest number of blatant lies and misrepresentations slipped into a single political speech. But it sounded good. And you know what's interesting about narratives? Once they're on the web, they're really difficult to get hold of. They're like slugs. They always leave a track. And even if there's nothing to it, a track is left. And so. It might be the, the, the nasty situation that we don't want to get to is a situation in which we worry about voter maximization because we can get good narratives padded by whatever goes on on the web. And those narratives become more and more robust the more people actually chip in based sometimes on social proof and sometimes on qualified opinion. Social transmission, political contagions, stories that are basically have chances of getting high 
amounts of circulation, stories of fear, anger, all stories too are fascination stories, but right below them you got indignation, you got fear, you got anger. And then the nasty thing about the fact that whatever is viral is not necessarily true, and whatever is true is not necessarily viral. And what we don't want to end up in is the post-factual democracy. The democracy for which truth just doesn't matter as long as the narratives can be padded strong enough and you can get people to believe that everybody else believes that there is something to it that might be good enough for trading, oh, and good enough for winning an election, taking over a party, you name it. So what I'm trying to say to you here is that um, we should worry a little bit. I'm all for data. I'm all for us being on the web and all that. But our opinions, our, our investments, they seem cost neutral. And in and by themselves, they're insignificant. But when you aggregate them in large numbers, all of a sudden you get a very strong public signal as to what apparently is the right thing to do, believe, hope, feel, and so far. And if other people are in doubt, chances are they're going to look to you just because there are a lot of likes. So we'll look to each other. And then we'll all march down the wrong direction just simply because we don't reflect upon exactly what's the worth of my representation or rather my investment of my opinion on this thing. So be careful what you like, one. And two, be aware of the big killer bubble monster lurking in, out there in the sea of information just to snap you right in the butt when you think you're out of it. And by that, you'll end up in the bubble jaws. I think I will follow Forrest Gump here and say that's all I have to say about that. Thank you.